Well, tonight we return for a second lively look at uh, some things about Riverside Cemetery. And I think much of what we'll look at tonight, we looked at last year. So if you weren't here last year, it'll be the first time and you'll learn some new things. Those people who were here last year will hear the, the same thing again. One change was that tonight the mausoleum and the chapel both have been open for your inspection and we were not able to do that last year. So some of you took advantage of that, and I would give you just a couple uh, facts about the two buildings. The mausoleum was built in 1921, and uh, as you can see, it's a nice building inside with uh, marble. It contains 296 crypts, and I have good news. There is room for you. <laughs> still about 25 vacancies. So, uh, and not only that, the rest of the good news is that uh, committal in the mausoleum is cheaper than burial. So keep all that in mind. Not much on the mausoleum, but more on the post chapel that you are really looking at. Uh, back in the early 1900s, Mrs. Post came to Mr. Adams, uh, town clerk, and said, I have $2,000 I would like to memorialize my husband. And so Mr. Adams uh, put the money in a city fund, kept it in the bank, and in 1912 uh, decided that perhaps the cemetery could use a chapel. And so it was built of cobblestones that were being taken up from the streets of Alma at that time because they had progressed. They were replacing the cobblestones with bricks. And so he, uh, coming from Rock Strewn, Vermont, suggested that perhaps these cobblestones could be put to good use. And consequently, we have a cobblestone chapel. Now the chapel, uh, part of the stipulation was that the post, Mr. and Mrs. Post, would be interred in the basement of the chapel. And that occurred. Uh, He's in this corner, and she's in this corner, down in the basement. And of course, also in the basement are uh, frameworks to hold coffins uh, through the winter until graves can be opened in the spring. And so for a number of years, the chapel has been used to have graveside services during inclement weather during winter, and uh, then the coffins were stored down below. If you went in, you can see that the opening that was used to lower the coffins has now been closed, and uh, carpet has been put over it. But in any case, uh, the basement has been used for storage in a variety of things. Uh, the post uh, stones are there in the wall, and very frankly, people, the basement is pretty much of a mess right now. And uh, we didn't open it for you because it would be a little discouraging to go in and see it, I think. So those are some facts on the two buildings, two of the major buildings in the cemetery. Now I would say to you just a few things about the cemetery in general. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, this is not the first cemetery in Alma. The first cemetery was located at what is now a fairly busy place, the intersection of Wright and Superior Streets. Uh, just uh, to the edge of the railroad tracks. But as the city encroached upon this spot, the Ladies' Aid Society decided that a new cemetery was in order, and so they bought property here, 
I don't know how much, but anyway, here. And as a result, the remains were removed from the original cemetery to probably this hill. Um, I don't know for sure who was in that one and who was here. The only thing I really know is they didn't get everybody because when they were digging the foundations for the house just to the west of the railroad tracks, they found two sets of bones. And so the original people were not able to get all the remains. So this is really the second of the cemeteries in Alma. Just some quick facts about some things in this cemetery. Because the Masonic home has been here since 1912, there are four Masonic sections. One just over here, just a ways over the drive. One over near the mausoleum, another back beyond the mausoleum, and the newest one way in the far corner. They started in the corner, I suppose, because they kept running out of space and worked their way back now, coming back toward the rest of the cemetery. The Francis Burns home, run by the Maccabees, was here for a number of years, and there is a section for uh, those people just to the east of the mausoleum. There are a couple infant sections, one over near the mausoleum, one way to the back, next to the park, back near the building there. Uh, the Civil War monument, put up by the people of Alma, is back on the hill. You can probably see it back there beyond the one that has the ball on the top. Uh, the Potter's Field, if there is a such, would be back at the back of the cemetery. So these are just uh, some ideas of where certain things are, and I think the rest of the cemetery is pretty much a normal run-of-the-mill kind of cemetery. So, we're sitting tonight at the foot of what my friend Louise Davenport has named Pioneer Hill. The pioneers are buried over on that side of that drive and right behind us. This is all where our oldest and earliest settlers are buried, and not just people from the village of Alma, but also people from Arcata and Pine River townships. And so farmers uh, were also buried here back in those early years before other cemeteries had been established. Now every name on every stone here, friends, carries a story. It doesn't matter how young the person was, how old the person was, uh, if it was an infant who died at birth, if it was a man that I knew of who died with almost 300 direct descendants, each person touched other people's lives, and there's a story behind that individual. Most of those stories are gone. We just know that they lived, and every life is interesting, and every person is interesting. Those people are gone. Some of them are written up in county histories, some families have resurrected information about their ancestors, but for the most part, most of us know very little about the people that are buried, especially in this part of Riverside Cemetery. And yet, each life was a story, and while most of the stories are gone, some of the stories still exist, and I'd like to tell you five of those stories tonight. They're basically lives of people or things that these people did. So let's start with the first guy, and that was Ralph Ely, the man that founded this town. Ralph Ely was a native of New York State. Now what you will hear tonight quite often is that so-and-so came from New York State. Many of you know that. People came from Canada, New York State, Ohio, uh, came here to Michigan when they opened up the land, came in as pioneers, cut holes in the forest, built their log cabins, and were true pioneers. You will also hear one date frequently, 1854, the year after Ralph Ely came. Many people came in, and so that date will come up from time to time. While Elia was a young man, he moved to Indiana. In 1842, he got married to Mary Halstead. He sold his land in Indiana, came to Ionia, Michigan, and then left there seeking land of his own, obviously away from everyone else because he came along the trails of the river here before there was a mill pond, followed until he got down to about where the State Street Dam is, and on the north side, he said, here it is. This is where I'm going to clear some land 
and this is where I will build a cabin. He cleared two acres, he and his three companions, built a log cabin, and that winter hosted a lot of people coming in to look for land. We are told that the cabin, which is only 12 by 15 feet, grew very crowded, and they uh, believe ate in shifts. They went in and ate or whatever and came out and others went in. It was uh, in sleeping, it was simply wall to wall. So that little cabin off here in the middle of nowhere was located at the north end of what's now the State Street Dam. The next spring he called for Mary and their four children and they came from Ionia up the trails through the forest and when they got to the spot on the river they were on this side and they needed to be on that side and we are told, and it may be true, they simply felled a tree across the river, the trees were so big, and they had a bridge. And so Mary and the children got across to the right side of the river. More settlers came and more, and Ely recognized himself as not being just the founder but also the caretaker of this settlement. He started the first sawmill, he started the first grist mill, and uh, started the first store. But uh, goods to sell in this store were not easy to get. One way to do it was to go to Saginaw and get a raft or a barge and pile everything on and pull your way up the Titabawasi and all the way up the pine and get it up here and unload it and you have things to sell to the settlers, which he did at least on one occasion because as he came along through St. Louis, they had built a dam and it was gonna be very hard to get the raft over the dam so he simply tore out the dam. Now you know, there have been some feelings between St. Louis and Alma down through the years over one thing or another. If you total them all up, St. Louis has got reason to be mad at Alma and it started way back then. So, if you didn't want to get goods uh, by river, you could take a terrible trail through the woods to St. John's and try and get them back that way. That'd be uh, fairly difficult to do. The Ely's had two more children, a total of six. The town was just getting on its feet after the period known as Starving Gratiot in the late 1850s, where people uh, ate anything that they could get, and the state came to their aid. And then the Civil War started. Ralph Ely, being the patriot that he was, immediately requested Governor Blair permission to set up, a, organize a company of soldiers, and he did that. Now imagine this, picture if you can, how few people were actually here, how tough it was in the settlement and in the little farm spots all around this area, just clearings in the woods, people just struggling to make ends meet, on the verge of starvation most of the time, and yet when Ely said, President Lincoln has called, we will answer, and got his permission from Governor Blair, nearly 80 of those pioneer men volunteered to go. And so you have Company C of the 8th Michigan Infantry heading off to this rebellion which they thought they could probably squelch in a pretty short time, having no idea it would drag on for four years. Ralph Ely was 41. Perhaps some of the other men were almost as old. He was the captain, and away they went to war, leaving the older people, the women, and the children to continue the farming, to continue the business of settlement. In numerous battles in the South, Ely went up from captain clear to brigadier general. He received the surrender of Petersburg, Virginia, near the end of the war. His brigade was attached to Sherman's army. After the war, he received a political appointment. He was made head or superintendent of the Freedman's Bureau in South Carolina, but in 1869 came back to his little settlement, Alma, and in 1872 was elected to the Michigan Senate from the 26th District. After one term, he was elected Auditor General of the State of Michigan in both 1874 and 1876. And during this time, built a very large home on State Street located where the Central National Bank is today, Commercial National Bank. And so in 1879, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, but I think I have a feeling about this, 
Am I Right was starting to come into town, and perhaps Mr. Ely thought there would be opportunities other places, Wright being a man with immense wealth. Anyway, Mr. Ely went up to Emmett County beyond Petoskey and began uh, lumbering there with his brother Flavius. On April 4th, 1883, he died up there at Cross Village, and he was buried there. And for years I wondered, why didn't they just bring him back? Well, he died in the spring, and the roads were too muddy to get his body to the Michigan Central Railroad so it could be shipped back to Alma. His widow, Mary, brought him back the next year, and he is buried near the great spruce right on the brow of the hill, um, our, our founder of Alma, Ralph Ely. On the tombstone are engraved Lincoln's words from his second inaugural, with malice toward none, with charity for all. So that's uh, Ralph Ely. His feelings uh, gives us some insight into the man who was the first here. If you go to the Alma Public Library, you can see his portrait there and also his sword. Uh, so that might be of interest if you haven't seen it. Now what about his widow? Well, Mary Halstead Ely continued to live in Alma for the rest of her life. And after an illness of seven weeks, she died at the age of 83 in August of 1905, at there at her home on State Street. And she too is buried there um, by the great tree. She had come from New York, and she'd been educated at a seminary for young women in Cincinnati, Ohio. But of course, she had married Mr. Ely in Indiana and come with him to Ionia. She'd taken a real interest in the early days of the village. And in the 1870s, when the railroad apparently was going to come from St. Louis over to Alma, she and some other ladies of the town really encouraged the railroad to come by subscribing the $300 to build a depot. That was apparently part of the deal. Other people in the town had to raise a sizable amount, but the ladies said they thought they could raise $300. And that seemed to lure the railroad then to Alma. The depot was built clear at the north end of State Street because that's where the railroad went across. A gorgeous Victorian building, which unfortunately burned within a few years. Mrs. Ely was very highly regarded. She was held in high esteem by the people of Alma and uh, lived here for the town's first 51 years with the exception of four years that she spent in Lansing while General Ely was Auditor General. Now an interesting sidelight on this, apparently Mrs. Ely's mother was living with them, perhaps in Lansing, because uh, her death occurred at that time. And uh, she is also buried here, Phoebe Woodworth Halstead. Mary Ely decided that she would name a street to honor her mother's maiden name, Woodworth. So that's how that street got named. Several of the Ely children continued to live here through their lives, married businessmen. They were among the leaders of the town. Some of them are buried up on the hill, or one just up the way, a little ways. Um, maybe one or two buried elsewhere. So let's move on to another story. Elyton was not very old, just a couple years old, when two men arrived, James Gargett and Horace Hulbert and they began expanding the town. They were both natives of, guess where? New York State. And on the day they arrived, they bought out Ralph Ely's store and opened it the next day. Uh, the two platted the land around this village of Elyton, as Mr. Ely had called his village. And Mr. Gargett named that addition Alma. And apparently, he was trying to memorialize a very bloody battle in the Crimean War, which had just ended the year before, the Battle of Alma Ata, which took place in Russia. Uh, we don't know. We are quite convinced he didn't name it after any relative, certainly not his wife or any children. He was married to Louisa G. Uh, in New York. She was the eldest of four children, and her three brothers, 
who were George, Isaac, and Joseph, all settled in Sumner Township in 1854. Great influx of people, pioneers that particular year. Gargett finally left his partnership with Holbert, and he became one of the leading businessmen in the village. He established a flour mill, and he established a woolen mill, engaged in lumbering and selling real estate. He prospered enough to build a mansion that cost $18,000 back then. You know, multiply that by probably 15 or 20 to find out what its value would be in today's money, and you'll understand that that was an unusual thing, very rare. Then bad luck struck. The house burned, the flour mill burned, the woolen mill burned. He had lost virtually everything. He eventually did rebuild some of these and continued as a businessman in the village despite all of this bad luck and misfortune. Now his wife, Louisa, was a woman of style and good taste and she opened the first millinery store in Alma. They were the parents of Minnie and George. Minnie married uh, William B. Humbert and I think I can read Minnie wife of William Humbert on that stone right there. I think I can. I don't know if you can or not, but I think that's, uh, it says Humbert on it at least. Then little Georgie died at age two. He was scalded to death. Typical of injuries, misfortunes to kids back then. A lot of infant and child mortality. Now, the Gargets did a lot for the town, but the thing that always impresses me most is, the, is what they did when they grew older. They built a kind of covered wagon, and in this, they traveled to Florida for the winter. Our first snowbirds, <laughs> sort of like the motor home of today. And they wrote letters back describing their journeys and uh, letting people know what it was like on the road. The Gargets are buried in a raised portion at the very top of the hill, a very tall stone. And after this is over, I invite you to go and all of the um, graves of the people I'm talking about tonight have signs on them to kind of identify where they are. Okay, we've looked at Ralph Ely. We've looked at James Gargett. We have to look at Gargett's former partner, Horace Holbert. Now, Horace Holbert continued to run the store that they had bought from Ralph Ely. In the store, he kept the post office. And the post office was kept in some pigeon holes in his desk that he had in the store. He kept his customers' accounts there, too. But just keep in mind, that was the first post office in that particular desk, because we're going to come back to the desk. He built a large three-story building as a store and warehouse. Soon he discovered that was too large. He remodeled it into a hotel, the Hulbert House Hotel, they called it. And if just within a few years, it burned. An awful lot of things caught fire in those early years. It was something to be expected. In 1878, he married Belle DePew, who was formerly of, <laughs> guess where, New York. And at that time, she was of Muskegon, though, having moved. Belle de Pew Hulbert was a lady of style. She loved exotic things, and in her later years, I am assuming she was the only woman in Alma to own a pet monkey. <laughs> Mr. Hulbert was in failing health for the years following the burning of his big building, became less active in town affairs, he died in the winter of 1898. She was in California at the time, and the funeral was delayed until she could arrive. Coming in by train probably took several days. The shock of his death and maybe the change in climate prostrated her, and she could not even attend the funeral. And so Horace Hulbert was carried to Pioneer Hill without his grieving widow. Now, that very same week in 1898, a well-known lady in the town died, Mrs. Nancy Holmes Cahoon. She was the wife of Lyman Cahoon, 
Now the Cahoons owned a fairly sizable acreage on North State Street on the west side. Probably at that time, not many houses that far up. Um, their fine brick home stood at the corner of Orchard and State, where the grounds of the Dewey Funeral Home are now. And in a, a few years after this, after the Cahoons had passed from the scene, that house was in the way because Mr. Francis King, who came here with Chicago money, decided he would build his mansion, which he did, which is now the Dewey Funeral Home, and he got all those grounds clear to the corner. They had to move the house. Well, the house today is on the north side of the Dewey Funeral Home, a red brick home, and I always wondered how did they do it. This is a little aside, people. Some of you probably know they simply took off all the brick, brick by brick, and all of the stone decoration, piece by piece, moved the superstructure, probably on rollers, towed by horses, put it on its new foundation, and masons re-bricked the whole house. So that's how they moved the brick house back then. Sounds laborious, that's the way it was. It was probably the quickest and safest way to do it. Now, back to the Cahoons. Now, Nancy, Mrs. Cahoon, had come to Gratiot County with her pioneer family in 1854. Lyman Cahoon had come in 1854. Pioneers, both of them. They were married three years later. They had eight children, six of whom survived Mrs. Cahoon. Now, we've got two families that have suffered deaths. You can probably figure out what's going to happen. Mr. Horace Hulbert had died, leaving a widow, Belle. Mrs. Nancy Cahoon had died, leaving a widower, Mr. Lyman Cahoon. And you know what happened before long. They got married. Mrs. Hulbert became Mrs. Cahoon, and interestingly enough, Mrs. Cahoon brought with her to the house the desk that her first husband had used as the post office in the first store in Alma. She had a sense of history that it should be kept. The new Mrs. Cahoon needed help around the house, and so she hired a gal from Riverdale named Alta Smith. Then a man came to town named Otto Lau. He was looking for a room. He found it at the Cahoon house. Can you guess what happened? Otto and Alta soon married. Well, Mrs. Cahoon and Alta became close friends, and in later years, when Mrs. Cahoon felt she had to give up her nice home, she disposed of her goods, and she gave to the Laos this desk from the first store in Alma. Then the desk passed to the Laos son, Donald, and after his death, the family, and according to his wishes, donated it to the public library. So this 130-year-old cherry desk from the first store in Alma, the desk that was the first post office, is there in the library, and you may go see it when you wish. Both the Hulberts and the Cahoons are buried here on Pioneer Hill. Anybody who drives by on the road or goes to the cemetery always spots the two statues. They always wonder, who are they? They must have been important people. Well, this is as much as I know. I wish I knew more. Maybe there's not that much to know. Enos Kimmel came to Gratiot County in 1854. You're getting very good. <laughs> With his parents, he was 14 years old. He worked on the family farm until the Civil War broke out. He heard Ely's call and was one of those 75 men who went into Company C and went off to war. He served for the entire war. He fought in 18 battles, and it says right on the base below the statue that he was wounded three times. After the war, he returned to Gratiot County, bought 80 acres out west of town, continued to farm for the rest of his life. 
In 1905, it was reported in the local paper, just as a matter of interest, I think, that he was still using a razor that he had taken from a Confederate soldier at the battle at Spotsylvania, Virginia, in 1864. He had used it to trim the beards of fellow soldiers because he was the regiment's barber. And then he continued to use it here for 41 years up to that point. Immediately after the war, he married Elmira Rice from Clinton County. They had three children. She died in 1873. Two years later, he married Lydia Franklin from St. Louis. She died. In 1878, he married a widow, Mrs. Alice Hale of Alma. So this was his third wife. So why the elaborate monuments to the farmer and his first wife? Well, this makes the interesting story. Apparently, the third wife kept a fairly close hand on the purse strings. And in desperation, one day, Enos Kimmel went out and ordered those statues to memorialize his first wife and himself. Now, I don't know what kind of message the third Mrs. Kimmel got from that, but I have a feeling I can figure it out. Those statues, of course, are marble. They would have been carved in Italy. That means they would have been very expensive. At that point, he didn't care. And so these statues would have been shipped over, brought to Alma, put on their huge granite bases. And so there you have them today. Vandals have broken off his rifle and his sword because he was proud of being in the Civil War, so he's carved as a soldier. She has a baby in her arms, and the name of the statue is Firstborn. Now, if you know more about him, let me know. He's pretty interesting, the more you get to know about him, I think. I, what a gutsy guy to try something like that, and to succeed, I guess. Now, as we've said, every stone in the cemetery, no matter how small, no matter how large, memorializes an important person. But I consider it to be the most interesting story about anybody that I know of that's buried here. There probably are other very interesting stories, but I think this one is most amazing. Two small stones and a family marker mark the grave of a couple who had a great influence on Alma, and I don't know upon how many other million people you could go past their stones and never know, unless you just happen to know the history of how important these people actually were. Charles and Mary Scott are their names. Charles M. Scott was the grandson of Captain David Scott, who came into the wilderness in Clinton County in 1833, lived in the wigwam of an Indian chief until he could build his log cabin. He founded the village of DeWitt, took 2,400 acres for himself, and started a little fiefdom in the forest. He and his wife had several children. Sylvester, who was the father of our Charles M. Scott, died young, and that left his children to the care of the grandparents. They raised these children. And Charles M. Scott was the first white child born in Clinton County in 1836. His playmates were Indians. He grew very proficient with the bow and arrow and the javelin. He was a white child way off in the wilderness. After the village of Lansing was begun, he left DeWitt and went to Lansing and there learned the harness trade and moved clear to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to practice it. When the Civil War broke out, he enlisted in the Pennsylvania Cavalry. He re-enlisted clear to the end of the war. The Second Battle of Bull Run, he was wounded. He fell from his horse. The Confederates captured him. And subjecting him and others to fierce forced marches, he was taken to a Confederate prison. And there he languished for quite a while. The deprivations that he went under in this prison ruined his health for the rest of his life. 
He always suffered because of being imprisoned. He eventually was exchanged in a prisoner exchange and in 1865 came to Alma, opened a harness shop on East Superior Street. Now, going down Superior Street these days, you cannot imagine that it was mud, and to get from one side to the other, you sometimes just jumped on little pieces of high ground and grabbed bushes to keep from falling in. That was Superior Street, if you can possibly picture that. In 1868, he went back to Clinton County and married Mary Weber, daughter of another pioneer family there. The two families, the Webbers and the Scotts, had been friends, fast friends, for years. And so he married someone he had known probably all his life. Both families were extremely religious. He worked hard in his harness shop. And for a while, he served as postmaster, but his failing health in his later years confined him to his bed, and his devoted wife took care of him, clear to his death. Now, when Mary married Charles Scott and came to Elma, the harshness of being a pioneer woman meant nothing to her. She had grown up in it right from the start. And what a frontier woman she was. She and her father owned a large, magnificent riding horse, and she brought that with her to Alma. Men were afraid of it. Her friends said it will be the death of her. Mary could control this horse, and apparently only Mary could control it. And at a time when they had people on the stage, Mary would mount her magnificent horse and gallop at a furious pace to visit her family in DeWitt, and she made the trip in a day without any problems, unarmed. She was a great horsewoman. She was an expert with a rifle. Alma was a wild lumber town in those years, especially as the drives came through down the pine. Women generally locked their doors if their husbands were away just because of the carousing that went on. One block had been left open with no buildings. And that's where the lumberjacks came and had pretty wild times. And there were taverns there to fuel the fire. And things got a little scary for some of the people. This decadence led Mary Scott to start a Sunday school in the first frame building in Alma. It was the schoolhouse that stood where the Alma hardware stands today. And so she held Sunday school there. And out of that Sunday school came three congregations. They met in that building at different times on Sunday. And she was instrumental in starting all three, Baptist, Methodist, and Congregational. To do this and to encourage people to come to church, she and her husband every Sunday brought their own pump organ and carpet, which they put down on the floor, and helped conduct all of these Sunday schools in these fledgling churches. very dedicated worker in her chosen church, the Congregational Church. And after the founding of Alma College by the Presbyterians, the establishment of the Presbyterian Church in Alma, she encouraged her own church, the Congregationalists, to join the Presbyterian Congregation. And the Presbyterians bought the Congregational Church, which is presently the First Baptist Church. And the congregations merged, and she became a very dedicated worker in her new church, the Presbyterian. In 1874, Alma was suffering from the railroad fever. The railroad was on its way, but she had to get it here with $22,000 in pledges. The people of Alma had to raise that much money. They could only get to 17000 Everything stalled there. The railroad said, we don't come unless you pay. That's when Mrs. Ely and Mary Scott canvassed the ladies of the town and said, can we raise enough money to build that depot? And the ladies said, yes, we can. So at the meeting with the railroad officials, where the town fathers had to say, we have only $17,000, the ladies came forward and said, but we can build the depot. We certainly will do it if you will allow us to. 
Well, that was pretty exciting. Probably shamed the guys a little bit. But Captain Krav, the railroad company, was so excited, he donated $50 to each of the three churches because he knew that Mary Scott had had quite an influence in helping this deal to go through. Then with strawberry socials and a few dances in one of the halls, they were able to raise the $300 to build the beautiful depot. Charles and Mary Scott had no children of their own. She had a very generous heart, and that was at work when she and her husband adopted a little boy, the, the baby, the orphan of Jewish parents who had died here in Alma. There was a little bit of prejudice here, and people said, with his background, he will never amount to anything. But Mary Scott imparted her strong faith to him, and he became Reverend C. E. Scott, a minister of the gospel in this country and a Presbyterian missionary to China. Now, this Reverend Scott and his wife had several children in China, including a daughter named Betty. Betty grew up to marry a man named John Stam, and they became missionaries in China as well. In the 1930s, John and Betty Stam were killed by the communists in China. They had a tiny daughter, Elizabeth, who was spirited to the coast, wet nursed by various Chinese women along the way, and her life was saved. But if you make a list of 20th century Christian martyrs, the names of John and Betty Stam will always be on that list. Whole sermons have been preached about them. Books have been written about them. And last Sunday at church, I heard a hymn sung that had been written in their memory. And their grandparents, her grandparents, are buried just across the drive over there. It says Scott on the big stone. The two individual stones don't even match. You probably drove by the stones coming in. Maybe you've seen them before. I say how many millions were touched because of Charles and Mary Scott's devotion to their faith. Truly amazing, I think, as I look back upon that. Charles Scott, as I have mentioned, spent his last years as a bedridden invalid cared for by his devoted Mary. He died in 1902. Her health was already failing. She spent the last years in constant pain. We are told she never complained. She lived with her son, who at that time was preaching, various pastorates in the state. In 1905, she died at his home in Albion, Michigan, on a Sunday, as he was at a Sunday service preaching the faith that she loved so dearly. These are the stories of some of our pioneers, stories that remain today, and they do amaze me. I hope they amaze you too. Now, you may go home if you would like. You may walk over Pioneer Hill if you like, or wherever. I've tried to identify the stones of those particular individuals whose stories I've told tonight. The Scots are there, the rest are on the hill. I didn't put the Kimmels down because everybody can find a statue. <laughs> the other thing uh, that you may do if you wish is watch me do a gravestone rubbing. Now why would anybody put a piece of paper on a gravestone and get an image of it? Well there are several reasons. Uh, the stone that I intend to work on tonight is extremely beautiful. It's a work of art. I have great respect for the people who were able to carve these stones. One thing that helped them, uh, they carved marble, which is soft. That's why a lot of the stones are in poor condition. They've just weathered very badly. But the stone I've chosen uh, tonight is in, I think, very excellent condition. And I'll get an image, the exact size of that stone, that I can take with me as a, a memory of, of that particular stone. I don't know anything about the man. 
but he's got a really neat stone. The other thing you can do, you see, in doing gravestone rubbings is take one home and hang it up on the wall. And you will probably get a lot of questions from your friends, and some of them may never come back. So thank you very much, your most attentive audience. <clears throat> The stone I'm going to work on is a, a fairly tall stone at the round top, right over on the edge of the road over there, right next to a fairly new one. It's just on this side of the, uh, the road. So if you leave, um, please be careful because my leg may be sticking out in the road there, okay? <laughs> Now the paper I'm going to use is a rice paper and I hope to make each of these a success because the current going price for my catalog is 90 cents a sheet. So it's uh, very special. <clears throat> now as you can see this particular stone is going to outstrip the uh, the paper, but we'll go ahead with it that way anyway. The key is getting the paper fairly snug. This is a paper that is fairly strong and yet it seems to pick up a pretty good image. And I've used other papers such as uh, this, which came out of an operating room, and it's a very strong paper too. This uh, I like, in a sense, better than the rice paper because this was free. <laughs> now you can get rubbing wax. Uh, this is a black. I'm going to use brown. You also can get it in a variety of colors. I have a kind of a brownish gold one, red, green, blue, but the brown has kind of a nice touch to it. The first thing you do is find out where all the important edges are and try to outline those and you avoid getting wax on the stone. but at least will give representation 
of some of the different parts that are there. I just think the basic uh, design of the stone is a very interesting one, fairly intricate. Now, I think I'll go over the outside outline here as much as possible first. Yay! I don't know what it will do for the digestion, but... Pardon? You can use a crayon. This wax is made especially for this kind of thing. I got this wax from uh, Boston, so you have to get the catalog. I had a very hard time finding the address, too. Look how nice and flat that section is. Now what's exciting is to find writing that's as fine as this. This guy should not be ashamed of his tombstone at all. It's a real work of art. Okay, now, common things have different uses. A piece of nylon stocking. You just kind of burnish it and it moves into some of the whiter, little white areas.
And there you have it. Wonderful. <laughs> now you probably want to get another look at what the stone is actually like. Um, no, that the, this is from this came from the operating room. Oh, I don't know what they use. It's a drape sheet. 